Scott from the branch and to Paul, the IOSH regional manager for inviting me to speak to your branch this evening. When you are a health and safety consultant, you should expect to find yourself presenting at events like this one as a part of your marketing. Today, however, I am not selling anything. Instead, I'd like to share my experiences of setting up as a health and safety consultant. I've done it three times. This could set you on a route to success and financial independence. I've had a great career. And if I had my time again, this is what I would do. I'll be happy to answer your questions at the end of the session, and we'll send you a copy of my slides as a matter of course. We're going to start this session with a short survey, just a couple of questions to see your current status and your future plans. Paul, will you lead, through us, lead us through that, please? Yeah, so you should see on your screen now a couple of questions. Um, question one, question two, there's a single answer for each. Question number one is, what is your current status? Um, you can choose one of those. So if you just click on the screen for us to choose from there. And then question two, uh, what are your future plans? So again, A through to um, E, choose one from there, two questions. So we'll leave, leave you a minute or so just to, just to have a look through those. And then we'll share those uh, results with you. I think that's okay. People still joining, so we'll put those people in as well. Great. Okay. Nearly there. I think we've done about 80% or so. So people are just completing those. So thanks so much for doing that. <clears throat> A few seconds, Stephen, and we'll share those with you. Okay. Great. We'll get those shared. There we are. Thanks so much. We'll, uh, they should be on the screen now. Okay, so question one, we have a lot of uh, people who are full or part-time employed and some other people. We've got 14% of our audience who already run their own company. They, they may be my competitors, that's interesting. And then let's have a look at future plans. Could you just scroll a little further? I can only see the question. Okay, we've got to, oh, crikey, a lot of people who'd like to transition to a consultancy role in the next uh, few years. Wow, 71%. Um, so you're in the right place, is the way that I would uh, put this to you. So, uh, Paul, if you could close that for us, that would be extremely helpful. And we'll press on with our content. So let's take a little look at what I'm going to cover in my session this evening. I'm going to be something of the order of 40 minutes. And as I said, there'll be time for additional questions. Anything that you want to ask me, I really will try my best to help you with it. So uh, we've dealt with the pre-session survey, 71% employed and 71% thinking of a consultancy role in the future. Uh, we're going to move on from there and I'll tell you my story, how I came to set myself up as a health and safety consultant in 1995, uh, for the second time in 1999, and for the third time more recently in 2017. Uh, we'll move on to some essentials. Uh, if you're familiar with the standard ISO 45001, uh, it talks a lot in section four about context. And I'd like to see if we can contextualize what this is all about, some things that you really should uh, think about before you even start uh, contemplating uh, a move into consultancy. I've got some thoughts about your current mindset, and you'll see that when we get there. And we'll finish off with a checklist. So if you're absolutely ready to hit the start button, 
there are some things that I think would be really very helpful to you. I will finish with my contacts. And if you want to be in touch with me after the session, uh, that would be absolutely a pleasure. And I will look forward to talking with you about all of that. So we'll, we'll move on to, to my story. It's a story really that starts in 1984. It runs all the way up to present. And uh, this is pretty much the start of the story. In the early 1980s, I studied law. And I'm sure there was a, a version of me that might have been dealing with divorces or the purchase and uh, sale of property, houses and so on. Um, as it happened, I went to work for a construction company. And pretty much what happened right at the start of all of that, I became involved in handling employers' liability insurance claims. Uh, interesting times. I, some of those things stay with me. The truth is, I remember almost everyone I spoke to could tell me what, they, uh, what the company should have done or what the supervisor should have prohibited. Um, we were very reactive on safety in those times. From 1984 to 1985, I set up health and safety management systems. I'm sure like many of you, I chaired health and safety committees. I represented my employers. You can see who they were in criminal and civil courts. And, and it seems I must have done a reasonably good job. Uh, I was nominated by my final company's employ, uh, insurance company, GKN, um, and I won a ROSPA Health and Safety Professional of the Year Award in 1995. Would you believe it? Uh, sponsored by Royal and Sun Alliance Insurance, shortly afterwards they head hunted me. And that's pretty much my first move into the consultancy sector. Uh, I started off as a member of the Royal Sun Liability uh, Consulting Team, and I ended up as head of the Royal Sun Liability insurance uh, consulting team. And at that time I had clients including Coca-Cola, uh, the McDonald's Corporation, Marks and Spencer. I did some of my uh, most interesting work with the Panama Canal Commission. I worked with organizations like Malaysia Airlines, extremely interesting times. And that's the first logo that you see here. So that, that's the first time I set up into consultancy. I felt I was ready to step into a company that I created myself. Uh, Royal Sun were very supportive. Uh, they helped me with uh, contributing business. Uh, I set it up with two other people. Uh, there were three of us at the start of that journey. And um, it was set up on the 5th of May of 1999. And I sold that company to an insurer uh, called uh, Henderson Insurance Brokers Limited. And I stayed for a handover uh, of all the customers and all of our products and all of our accounts. Uh, I took the new owners to see our customers and so on. And I was with the business until 2016. There's the CRS company. I hope you've seen its logo over the years. You might have even been our customers. That would be nice if you had been. Uh, when I left uh, CRS, uh, which was part of the contract of the sale, I spent one year on garden leave and I was asking myself the question, should I retire or am I too young? Am I not ready for that? And I decided that when uh, the rules of the, the sale allowed, I would set up a new company. And that's exactly what I did. The All Safe Group Limited was founded on the 1st of July of 2017. And that's my current employment. It, it really is a much smaller company than, uh, than the previous. It's uh, just, just a few of us on this occasion. I don't quite have the appetite for uh, repeating my career 1999 uh, all the way through until 2014 once again. So our, our customers now are what I call a small number of preferred clients. That They're people that I truly enjoy working with. So I've, I've made a decision three times to leave what I would call a perfectly good job and step out into uh, this rather more interesting field of consultancy. 
And there are a number of essentials I would put before you, before you contemplated making such a um, manoeuvre. So let's take a look at some of those. So I, I think my first suggestion, uh, perhaps the first essential is to get yourself a really good qualification. Uh, my view, and in many ways, I've been an IOSH member for you know, a big part of my adult life. So, you know, you'd forgive me if you're not an IOSH member, but I think that the, uh, the top qualification for health and safety practitioners is chartered membership or indeed chartered fellowship of IOSH. And as you probably know, there are three main routes to that. You can arrive with a health and safety degree. Uh, you can arrive with a NIBOSH diploma uh, or you can arrive with a national vocational qualification in occupational health and safety. Uh, you'd be rooted into a graduate membership of IOSH at that point, uh, following the process through IPD, Initial Professional Development. I, I'm sure you'll have had talks on that previously, so I won't go into the detail of how that works. And should you pass through IPD successfully, you become, uh, and quite rightly so, a chartered member of IOSH. In my experience, this is a, a fundamental requirement for operating in the field of consultancy. Uh, my clients certainly have felt reassured. They felt confident that the person that they've been hiring, proposing to hire to help them is uh, indeed properly qualified and up to date with CPD. I think a second essential is absolutely to know what your product is, to know what your service is. And, and bearing in mind you'll be doing this for a living, I ask anyone that asks me about this, well, what do you enjoy? You know, are you happiest as a trainer? Are you happiest as a consultant? Uh, are you happiest with a blend of those two things or, or indeed something else? What are you really good at? Um, over my career, uh, I've written six books and I quite like writing books. I'm actually just about to start my seventh book. I'm writing with one of the IOSH council members, um, some sections for safety at work. You might know that uh, title is in its eighth edition, and I'm writing part two of the ninth edition. And I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I found a spot uh, in my uh, career where I became quite good and quite enjoyed auditing, and three of my books are about auditing. So I've done a lot of auditing work as a consultant. As I said, I've been close to IOSH for a long time and I've had uh, licenses for a number of IOSH training courses. Uh, I was saying to your chairman just earlier before we started that uh, I'm actually back in the classroom now. I delivered my first in-class IOSH Managing Safely just a couple of weeks ago, and I thoroughly enjoyed having live human faces back in the classroom with me just once again. I think another absolute essential is to be good at networking. Over the years, I, I've been in a number of business groups. I, I, I still now have contacts that I first met in the 1980s. I used to attend safety groups, um, the ROSPA safety groups, as well as IOSH safety groups. I, I was uh, a member of the IOSH council from the 1990s until 2012. Um, I've been members of chambers of commerce and uh, business groups. And the truth is that many of the people I met then became customers later. And I think if you do have a picture of where your customers might be it is extremely helpful and in the early days where you're thinking about moving to consultancy it is reassuring if you can you know point to key people who might be your customers one day i think another essential is to think about who you want to be and of course these two things are not mutually exclusive you, you could be either of these two things or a mix of the two so certainly a lower risk, lower reward model is to become a servant to another health and safety consultancy. They're, they're commonly known as associates. You know, I'll say to you back in my CRS days, 
a common product we offered to associates. We would interview people, try, you know, try and find the right people, and we would offer them £10,000 for 40 days' work. And you can do the mathematics, that's £250 a day. That worked extremely well. Maybe there's been a little bit of inflation to go on to that. I think as an associate, you might reasonably earn £350 a day in the current window. Lower risk, lower reward. I think if you want higher reward, you probably have to take a greater risk. And one of the ways that you might do that is to run your own business to business consultancy, where you go find your own customers and you uh, establish yourself as a, a valuable service provider. And in my experience, you'll find rates available to you there in the 700 to 2000 pounds a day bracket. So that's been my picture. And, you know, we've got some other consultants with us. Um, you know, if, if you are competing with me, that's the price band that you are typically comparing with. And if you wish to pursue a career, anything like the one that I've pursued, I think these are the absolute essentials. Before we leave the slide, I do think there is one final line I should bring to your attention, and it startles people sometimes. I think you really should expect to work much longer hours than Mr. Mrs. Mixter, Monday to Friday, nine to five. I will give you an example of that. Uh, I mentioned that I'd worked with the McDonald's Corporation. That's the burger guys um, some years ago. Um, my contact at McDonald's wanted to do a project 29 days straight. That was every day for 29 days, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every Friday, weekends too. And it was an incredibly intensive project. Now, the truth is, I absolutely enjoyed every day of it. It was fascinating and I still talk about it. Um, but do bear in mind, it's not nine to five uh, in many consultancy businesses. You, you, you don't always get quite the freedom you promised yourself when you said, I'm going to work for myself. Now, we should move on. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the business side of running a consultancy. And if I could summarize this in one word, the word would be liability. So let, let's think about liability just for a moment. I think of it as a bit like an evening out. Usually everything goes fine. But if you crash the car, there are many possible liabilities that you can face, both criminal and civil. So it is very important to think about how you will establish your company. Again, they, they relate to risk quite a lot. If you are a sole trader, they can quite literally have your shirt off your back if things go wrong, if you create liabilities. Uh, a way to protect liability is to set up a limited liability company. And there are a variety of ways to do that. I've given some of the examples here, PLC companies, limited liability companies, and also limited liability partnerships. And I encourage you to reflect on liability. Uh, it also helps you when you're thinking about your business name. And I'd ask you to, you know, bear in mind two examples I'll give to you. You know, on one hand, you could be Birmingham Health and Safety Services. You know, and it paints a picture of who you are. Whereas on the other hand, you could be International Safety Limited. So they do impact on liability and certainly they speak to your customers in different ways. On the business side, there's something else that we should be absolutely clear about. Uh, there are lots of laws around a variety of taxation. So we start off with uh, registering for self-assessment, uh, the point where your turnover comes over a thousand pounds. So that's three days as a servant, as an associate. It might only be a single day as a business to business consultancy. So, so you'll hit that threshold very quickly 
and you'll need to register with the government, uh, its tax department at uh, gov.uk uh, for self-assessment. There's another measurement of tax that's quite important and it's VAT, value added tax. Uh, certainly the threshold for mandatory registration is presently 85 thousand pounds and it tells a story to your customers of how big you are so for example if you are not VAT registered it tells them that your revenue is less than 85 thousand pounds it, it says to them you're a small company now you can register for VAT straight away there's no minimum threshold but there has been a recent change called making tax digital. So it's actually very recent. If you are a VAT registered business, you have to use making tax digital MTD VAT software. You have to do digital accounting. You, you can no longer run it in a double entry paper book. And you do, do have to think about that on the business side. Um, I'll come to taking advice later, but the advice of an accountant here seems a very sensible piece of advice to me. Now, as we get to the business side in a bit more detail, you might recognize this chronology. You know, if you're an employee, you go to work on Monday at nine o'clock, if that's what your contract requires. If you're running a business, it's different. You may have nothing to do on Monday. And when you have downtime, it's often used prospecting for business you know for example presenting at events like this one it might be visiting customers it might be working on the internet or tendering and at some point you might get an inquiry you know and they ask you would you like to deliver a managing safely course would you like to carry out some auditing for us would you like to write a manual and uh, you'll make a pitch you know you'll say it's this many pounds a day and it's this many days and if you're fortunate, you will develop uh, some uh, an order and the order will lead to work. Now, it may not be straight away. I've got orders now for 2023. You know, I have every optimistic uh, position that that work will follow through come of the day. But you don't always do it immediately. When the work is done, you can raise an invoice. And when you've raised an invoice, you will get some revenue. And I would encourage you to think about all of this. There'll be the day rate and then your project rate. And then you have to think about your likely utility rate. And what I mean is, will you be able to work 100% of available days? And in my experience, you will not. I, I think you probably won't. So, you know, let's follow the mathematics through. Imagine for a moment that you could work for four days a week. That would give you a day for things like prospecting and invoicing and holding meetings. Um, four days a week is 16 days a month and 16 days a month is 192 days a year. And if you were able to deliver 192 days a year at £350 a day, you could write down 67, 200 pounds as your likely revenue. You know, you can see the future in those uh, um, perspectives, I'm sure. But of course, there is a difference between revenue and profit. And we should make sure that as we understand the business side, we absolutely see that. There is an extremely important formula, and it goes P equals R minus C. Profit equals revenue minus costs. And you can measure that in pounds or you can measure it in percent. A very common business measurement is EBIT and it stands for earnings before interest and tax. It's, it's another way of saying, frankly, profit. So in a consultancy business, 10% would be a bit low. In a consultancy business, I think 20% you would be doing very well. You'd have great revenue and low costs. Uh, many consultancy businesses operate at about 15 to 16 percent. And 
I know we've got consultancy businesses in the audience, and I'd, of course, be interested to know uh, your position on that. So let's look at the formula. Uh, revenue minus costs. Imagine you've earned £100, but it costs you £90 to earn it. So you'll have to pay for perhaps an office and a website. You may need a telephone or a car or a photocopier, all those sorts of things. Things like insurance, the services of an accountant. If it costs you £90 to earn £100, you'll see in the example here that your profit is £10. Now, against this backdrop, I should caution you on the business side about discounts. Discounts are the enemy of profit. Uh, it's all too easy to say, oh, well, yes, if you'll buy two or if you'll buy three or if you'll buy 10, I'll give you a 10 percent discount. So let's rework that formula. A hundred pounds minus 10 percent is 90 pounds. If you've done nothing on your costs, 90 minus 90 means that you'll be working very hard for zero profit. And it's, of course, important that you recognize that at an early stage. On the business side, it's very important that you give some thought to cash flow. So the income or the revenue that you earn and the expenditure through time. So you'll have a pattern of future income. You know, a typical project might be that you give a day a week or a, a day a month to a client and they will pay you on 30 day terms after the day is provided. And likewise, you will have expenditure through time. So the phone bill will come in every month. If you have a building, the building rent will be due every month, perhaps. And you start to flow out in a pattern, the income and expenditure through time. Uh, if you've never seen this being calculated, I, I do encourage you to watch a TV show called Dragon's Den. I was actually on it. Uh, I launched uh, and pitched a software product in 2007. It was a, a thoroughly uh, invigorating exercise. And uh, always the dragons, the investors want to know about cash flow. I encourage you to have a look at it. Uh, if you don't know Dragon's Den, there's an international program called Shark Tank. I understand we've got some international uh, participants in our session today, and you'll see the same sort of idea just there. I think a final piece I'd like to bring to your attention on the business side is what in the United Kingdom is known as IR35. Now, this, this is interesting legislation. You'll see what it's about. It's designed to identify contractors and businesses avoiding paying tax by uh, asking people to leave and then hiring them back. You know, they're really employees, but they are disguising their true employment status. So it's, there are some tests here. And uh, if you engage an accountant, the accountant will undoubtedly want to make sure that you really are an independent contractor and uh, not one of the people here, because ultimately both parties to this uh, tax avoidance are going to be caught one day and uh, that would not be in your, of course, best interests. So th these are my thoughts on the business side. And, you know, I'll welcome any questions. I see we've got some coming in already and I'll deal with them later on. Now, I'm going to say to you, consultancy is not for everyone. Um, you know, we'll see if we can understand why that is so. I've got uh, six or seven things that over the years I've heard people say, and uh, I wonder if any of these things are you. Um, if these are not you, it, it's possibly true that consultancy and you are absolutely made for each other. If any of these are you, let's take a look at an example of the first one. Um, consultancy may not be for you. You know, so for example, if you've ever said, I'm hoping to get a pay rise, I'm going to talk to my boss about extra holidays. It would be great if I got a better car or a secretary or a, a bigger office or, you know, a window with a view. This may not be for you. 
I mean, I'm not saying that you can't give yourself a pay rise, but it, it doesn't work that way round. It doesn't come from wanting it. it. It comes the other way round from earning it. You know, if you've ever thought or if you've ever said in a few years, I should get a promotion when my boss screws up. I'm going to get a promotion when my boss leaves. I'll get a boss, uh, a promotion when my boss retires or dies. That's not how it works in a consultancy business. I remember calling myself uh, managing director and realizing that the managing director also put the stamps on the envelopes. You know, promotion doesn't feel the same. You can have any title you want, but it doesn't make any difference to the reality of what you'll likely be doing. You know, I, I hear people say that business owners are greedy, are bad people who should pay higher wages and more taxes. I assure you as a business owner, that's not what I think. I absolutely do not want to pay higher wages than I have to pay. And I absolutely don't want to pay any more taxes than the law requires. Because if I add those to my costs, I reduce my profit. I think if anybody says things like, I'm going to stay in this job for a few months, I'm going to stay in the job for a few years until I get bored or until you know I get the push for one reason or another, this sort of business might not be for you. If you remember the years, I ran CRS corporate risk systems for 17 years. You know, as I reflect on that now, even at 56, it was a very major part of my life, almost one third of my total life. The next one uh, has always made me smile. Customers are a nuisance. They get in the way of me getting my job done. I'm not really sure that's true. I think what I've learned uh, as a small businessman is that customers are the reason that I exist. Customers make paydays possible. And uh, you have to turn your mind to that way of thinking, I think, to make it successful. You'll see some other examples here. You, you can read them. It's not my job. I'm going home soon. I'm going to get a gold watch one day. My conclusion here is, as I said, consultancy may not be for everybody. If you still think that consultancy might be for you, as I said earlier, I've got a setting up checklist and I'd like to, uh, to share it with you. Over the three times I've done it, I think this was perhaps the most important thing that I did. You know, there really are implications here. Uh, the implications are positive and negative. A, a positive example, I have had partners join me in my business. My wife now works for my company. And she loves it. And we, you know, we, we cooperate and we work extremely well together. And, you know, it may be that your partner, your husband, your wife or somebody else might absolutely love the idea of a family firm, as I've called it in my notes here. Perhaps on the negative side, there can be other implications. You know, your time, as I've said before, may be different to nine to five. Uh, your clients may ask you to work weekends. I, I thought it was very nice that Kerry mentioned, uh, uh, your secretary mentioned all the journeys we've had. We've worked together in Texas. We've worked together in California. And Kerry, it was a great time. You recall all of that? Yeah, it was great. But, but we had to leave on Saturday to arrive in uh, America on Saturday night to set up training rooms and materials on Sunday. And then we worked from Monday to Friday and then we left on Friday night and we arrived back about lunchtime on Saturday. You know, it, it's not necessarily for everyone. And if it is for you, it's important that your wife, your partner, uh, your husband, your boyfriend really fully understand that. I made a note here in 2012, I made 85 flights. Yeah, uh, that was... Uh, a big ask uh, from my partner at the time. And uh, it's a smart thing to do to make sure that everybody in the family is on side. So if, if they're on side, this is what comes next. I think the preparation of a business plan, 
Over the years, I've found the banks extremely helpful. Um, I'm, I'm not on the commission of NatWest, but I've banked with them since 1984. They have some great business planning tools, proformers that you can use. Um, if you're proposing to borrow money, definitely the bank will want to see a business plan. If you're thinking of premises, if you're investing in noise meters, if you're thinking of investing in uh, packaged training course materials, you might need to go to the bank for some money. They will want to know what are your products, what are your services, what does the cash flow look like? You know, when does the money arrive in the month? When does it leave? When does it arrive over the course of a year? When does it leave? And also in the business plan, it is very smart to think carefully about your terms and conditions. Now, I, I really haven't got the time to go into the details of all of them, but the one that we found most interesting and in turn most challenging over the years are the terms and conditions when someone postpones or cancels. So remember, from your perspective, if you were thinking of being on site next week, a postponement and a cancellation are the same. You will not be there. The customer will, however, see a postponement as a no charge activity. And you'll probably find it very difficult to replace that client at such short notice. And therefore, the terms and conditions that you agree with the customer, I have found extraordinarily interesting. And if you get them right, very helpful for solving the problem at the time, should any of these occur. So third on the checklist, I have found over the years that taking advice has been invaluable. You know, I, I remember coming to this thinking I probably know everything. And I realize now that I absolutely do not. Uh, some of the areas that you'll deal with are extraordinarily complicated. So uh, some of the advice I would urge you to consider, there is uh, quite a lot of government support for small businesses and gov.uk is the entrance port for all of that. Uh, if you've got a current bank and many people have, uh, that might be a start place for some financial advice in terms of presenting accurate accounts so that the income you earn in any period and the uh, expenditure you incur in any period are allocated correctly. Uh, I've found uh, a number of accountants. I've, I've had three in uh, 22 years and each of them in their own turn have been very helpful to me. Uh, the same would be true for an insurance broker. Um, if you're concerned about liability, uh, having insurance is a very good idea. Uh, customers will ask you for professional indemnity insurance. Uh, if you have any employees, you'll need employer liability insurance, EL. And uh, if you're concerned about uh, losing the shirt off your back or your house or your car, some public liability insurance would also be a good idea. Uh, IOSH has got an insurance broker. I, I'm not recommending them because uh, I don't use them. I, I can't tell you one way or the other, but it might be a good start point. You'll find it on the IOSH Extras portal. Uh, it's a good idea to know a solicitor. You know, it's you, you don't need a solicitor until something crops up, but just having access to someone uh, who might give you advice is a good idea. And I think finally, I would network with other health and safety consultants. Would you believe it? The reason I know Kerry is because I networked with another health and safety consultant. And I think my final word on all of this is whoever you choose, choose wisely. I, I would advise against simply buying on price. And I think if you can get through those three things, uh, you actually come to a point where this keyboard presents itself to you. You know, you either hit the green key or you hit the red key, at least for the time being. I think my advice to you on, on the go is go or don't. I, I come across people over the years that have made what I call a half-hearted choice. 
you know, such as taking a day off work to do a job on the side. You know, I, you may have seen that. Again, we've got consultancy businesses uh, in the session. And, and my concern particularly there is to remember liability. And the question is, are you insured for that? Of course, we hope it goes well. But if it does not, are you properly protected? I think once you hit the go button, I've already talked about networking. I think, you know, making sure that you're out there, making sure that people can find you. And uh, on the marketing side, there are paid for marketing and you might want to establish a website. Um, I use one.com. I found them excellent. I've used them for a very long time. Uh, I, I've learned from them that I can actually create my own websites now. Of course, you can pay somebody else, but I've learned to do mine for myself. You can certainly hand your money to Google. And for, I think, £60, you can join the Oshka register. Uh, personally, I've not found that particularly helpful, but it's part of a package of marketing. If I gave you my general view on paid for marketing, I know that half of my budget over 20 years has been wasted. The problem is I don't know which half. You have to try all of these things and see which ones work for you. Superficially, you might say to your customers, where did you hear about us? But often they can't remember. Often they can't remember. We've done things like visit the National Exhibition Centre. I think we exhibited there six years in a row at the, uh, the National Expo in May. Of course, don't forget free marketing as well. Uh, the two that I use the most are referrals. You know, if I have a, a particularly good relationship with a customer, I commonly say, who might you refer me to? You know, can you advise me of any of the, your own personal contacts? And uh, I've just picked up a very large contract by precisely those means. And LinkedIn is also a pretty good source of free contacts as well. You know, if you want to put that to the test, say, can I deliver managing safely for you? And I rather suspect you'll get a number of people who reply to you. I mentioned this idea of customers, and I said earlier, customers are your raison d'etre. If you understand that in French, it's the reason for your very being. Remember, if there is no revenue, it ultimately equals the death of your business. I, I read statistics that said maybe two thirds of new businesses fail in the first three years. And of course, with a good business plan and, and the other advice, I would absolutely want you to be in the one third that makes a great success of it, as, as I found three times. I'll tell you, this, this idea of customers, nothing, nothing beats the euphoria of securing a contract for new work. You know, it's not the, oh, good, that you might have as an employee in a company. Let me tell you, if you ever lose a contract or if something gets cancelled, it's not the, oh, dear, of working for somebody else. It can be absolutely devastating. You know, and you get over it when the next new great high comes along. My tip for customers, actually, the best people to sell things to are your current customers. Ladies, gentlemen, good luck, whatever you decide to do. I've put on to the final slide my contacts here. You'll find me on LinkedIn and uh, you'll certainly find us on the Internet at theallsafegroup.com. If you like the website, remember, I made it. I learned to do that, to reduce my website costs. Uh, we are going to take questions after the session. I think we're going to put 10 or 15 minutes into that. If your question doesn't get answered, or if you'd like to drop me a line about anything afterwards, Stephen Asprey at theallsafegroup.com will come straight across my desk. Uh, before anybody asks, no, I cannot write their business plan. Uh, but if it's a sensible question, 
I'll be very happy to share my thoughts with you. Uh, finally, you'll find me on Amazon. If you want to see my books, you'll see my Amazon address. If you search Asprey Audit, you will absolutely get there. I just wanted to say one final thing in thanking the branch for the invitation to talk with you. I'm actually back in a year's time. I'm speaking to the branch again. Date for your diaries, 21st of March, 2023. And my talk is called Big Rocks, How to Manage Organisational Risks from the Context of Risk-Based Auditing. You might remember my special interest in auditing. I understand we've got a few questions. And as I said, I'm very happy, Chair, to deal with them. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Stephen. Um, brilliant. A lot to, to work through there um, and uh, a good uh, framework to, uh, for, for those of us that are refreshing and uh, maybe new consultants, and that would be, be great help for them. Um, the uh, question that I have really is a recommendation, if you can, on the value uh, that you would expect. I know we have these discussions for professional um, uh, liability insurance and that. Um, what sort of value or level would you use a business uh, for an associate to come in? Um, you know, I know we had these talks, didn't we, years ago, but um, what can you advise the, the group uh, at the moment? I think that's a really good question. And I, I'd like to answer it in two or three different ways. I mean, I'll start with a very, it'll sound glib, but, it, but it's a serious answer. The answer to the question, how much insurance cover do you need, is quite literally, how much can you afford to lose? Right. So, you know, if you can afford to lose a million pounds, don't bother with any insurance. Mm. OK, that's no, that's that's. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think another good answer is it would be a good idea to speak to an insurance broker. So an insurance broker will help you to understand what it is that you might lose. So, for example, if you are a sole trader, I think you are at greater risk than as a limited liability company. So if you look at my website, you'll see my company is called All Safe Group Limited. That's not a badge of honor. It is a warning to my customers that my liability is limited to the value of my share capital. Now, that is a, a, another answer. Um, I think another answer is, I shouldn't really give you an answer because if you knew I had a million pounds worth of insurance, you may pursue me for a million pounds. If you knew I carried 10 million pounds of insurance, anybody might come after me for 10 million pounds. Over the years, I have discovered that those who seek to sue often seek deep pockets. And the more insurance you have, well, the deeper your pockets appear to be. If I can give you a final answer, your customer will often tell you. Yeah. So if you work with a large organisation, they may tell you that they couldn't even engage you unless you had X thousand or x millions of pounds of insurance indemnity coverage so i'm sorry that's a, a, a difficult and four-part answer um, <laughs> but it's not a simple yes no it's not pick a number it's got a little more to it yeah no that's that's really well it's a, it's something to explore isn't it uh, for uh, people potentially moving into that sphere um, I, th I think speak to a broker is probably the short answer. Speak to an insurance broker and they will help you to determine yeah. the level that's right for you and the business that you're thinking of. Well, it's lovely. Um, thank you. We've got a couple of, uh, there's lots of uh, people saying, yep, yeah, brilliant. Well, uh, good, great presentation. Um, we've got uh, Philip Pauling. Um, he's, you may know the name. Steve, it's been a pleasure working with you for TVP as we, uh, whilst you might be saying, um, do what you enjoy. If somebody's putting a toe into the water of consulting, would you advise to start off training or general HSC advice? You know, I, I, I wouldn't choose either over the other. 
if I preferred one over the other. So I, I, I don't know if anybody here has ever been the best man or the, uh, the lady of honour at a wedding. And they, if, if, if you're the person that becomes terribly nervous just before you speak, maybe training's not for you yet. Whereas if you are born to speak, you know, the people that say, give me the microphone, I'll sing them all. It may be that training, the performance of training is absolutely for you. I, I see we've got Philip in the group. Philip, it was always a pleasure working with you. And uh, TVP is Thames Valley Police for anyone that doesn't know. Uh, I did a lot of consulting work with Philip and also his predecessors. And uh, until 2020, I was uh, involved in a lot of training of sergeants, also the chief constables management team. And Philip, it was a great pleasure to work with you for all of those years. I'm pleased you could join us tonight. So do yes. what you enjoy is the short answer. Great, yeah, that's what we all do. Um, and uh, Michael, Jack and Ellie, uh, he said, thank you, Stephen. When would you decide to break a relationship with a client based on their response to your expertise and advice? And another part of that is, do you have a system or approach for this to protect the professional reputation of your practice? That's a big one. That's a good question. Well, it's actually a fantastic question, and I think anybody in the in the consultancy field will will recognise the question. Um, I think the quick answer is yes. You know, I, I I don't want to be the advisor to a company that doesn't take advice. You know, I the, the way that I come to a client usually is either they're quite good to start with and want to get better. Or alternatively, particularly if it's an insurance referral, uh, there is a client that's terrible at managing health and safety and their premiums are going through the roof and the number of claims they're receiving is, is rolling down a mountain like a snowball. Um, but it's difficult to help a client that doesn't want to be advised. So yes, the quick answer is yes, but at the same time, I don't do that prematurely. I think for some clients, the approaches that we take can be very different to the approaches that they've taken historically. After all, they wouldn't be in the trouble they're in now if they'd been managing health and safety in a predictive and a preventive fashion. Uh, but ultimately, the answer is yes. I, if a company chooses not to take advice, you, you probably at some point have to consider leaving. And I would refer anybody to the IOSH Code of Conduct which really amplifies that point. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I think, Stephen, um, that's probably the one of the benefits of being a consultant, because if you're working as a health and safety professional in a company and you've got people who won't listen, uh, there's not a lot you can do about it except keep banging the drum. You can't walk away. Well, well, Clive, can I, I'll get, I do have a, a position on that. I think if it happens that you work for a company that won't take your advice, I actually think you should leave and find a company that's passionate about the things that we are passionate in. Why be sad? Why be miserable? Why be unhappy at work when there are lots of great employers that demand the sorts of services that IOSH chartered and graduate members are able to provide. Yeah, I, I think it's it's more to do with working for uh, large companies where you get um, managers, perhaps even directors who uh, want to go their own way. And <laughs> yes. listen. And yeah, yeah. That, that's difficult to manage. It is, it is, yeah, yeah, it is. It is, I, I, I mean, over the years, I have discovered that those managers don't always last a long time. So if, you know, if, if you're of the view that, uh, these people come and go in a year or two. Um, you know, it might be worth hanging on for the next management team. But if you're sure that uh, you've expended all your energy, it might just be time to move on. You know, variety, after all, is the spice of life. And I really do notice that careers seem to be changing from the old 30, 40 year gold watch careers that uh, were around when my father was in the workforce. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I, was, I was fortunate. I was working in university when I switched into health and safety and I knew the mindsets of the people I was working with. So there was always a way of getting around 
to uh, yes. persuading an academic that uh, yes. some of their work could benefit uh, from health and safety. I'm, yeah. I'm sure you're right. I think the whole area of interpersonal skills, you know, if, if it, we can't do it by uh, approach A, we have to try approach B and see if yeah. something different might work. Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, thank you. That was a really good presentation. Um, do we have any more uh, questions, Kerry? Uh, there aren't, no, just very insightful, as it says, food for thought from Stuart um, there. Thank you. Lots of thank yous um, for the presentation of that. Uh, so um, I'm sure there will be a, a lot more perhaps listening to the presentation when we upload it and that. So you may get more contacts and questions uh, via that route. So, um, yeah. Madam Secretary, if, if we've got 60 seconds, I'd, I'd like to show you, let me see if I can hold it up here. Yeah. This was the best promotional gift we ever did. Yes. <laughs> so I can tell you we've done bags of nuts, we did pens, we did rulers, we did mugs, you know, all, all that stuff, calendars, diaries, postcards, everything. Yeah. The best promotional gift we ever did was from 2005. We we sponsored uh, a classic mini racing car yeah. and with its lady driver, Caroline Gilbert, we put it on our exhibition stand at the NEC in Birmingham yeah. and it absolutely drew people over. Right. You know, we turned Caroline Gilbert, you know, who's a, a lovely woman who works in an accounts office in Nottingham into a mini superstar. And yeah. we showed that mini year after year after year, and people kept coming back. This little car here cost me four pounds ninety. We had a thousand of them made. These change hands on eBay now for over two hundred pounds. Amazing. And uh, I, I still go into clients' offices, and uh, you'll still find them sitting around in their cabinets and on the end of their desks and people still talk about them. I don't ever remember spending £4.90 on anything more valuable. Yeah. So you have to do what's, of course, right for you. But this little car with its web address and phone number on the side were absolutely right for us. Yeah, well, I catch you. Uh, I okay, still got thank you. <laughs> uh, do you want to take us through the uh, rest of the uh, proceedings, please, Kerry? Yeah. Yeah, um, so there is just a final um, slide that I just want to uh, share. Um, this is, and, and again, we'll, we'll come back to Stephen to see uh, the competence framework. With our talks now, we are linking the parts of the competency framework for each of those talks. So a lot of the branches are now doing this. Um, for this session, um, business skills generally, I'm sure you'll all agree, um, business skills are essential here. Um, and uh, the core material, you know, the core framework, uh, competency uh, criteria there, um, included with behavioural and technical aspects. So there's a lot to, to deal uh, from this session, really, with a link to the competence framework, um, which um, I hope you'll uh, agree and uh, get into those uh, criteria. Um, also, we're going to send out our post uh, event feedback survey if you wouldn't mind completing that and give us your you know views really on the session um, and how we may be able to improve uh, from this um, also for networking we have our QR code for um, any of the mentoring sessions that you may uh, need or to be a mentor or mentee web page for us as well linkedin page um, those are on the screen now if you would like to uh, use those qr codes and get straight to them um, and for the next talk uh, actually is for our agm um, to confirm the additional um, uh, positions but also for current uh, tenure um, and a talk with that so the AGM will only be a very short session um, but we have a talk um, and we have Andrew Lucas who's done a talk uh, with us before and he's doing a practical insight into a coroner's inquest so this will be uh, quite um, targeted to certain criteria with the competence framework um, and that is on the 12th of May um, so we look forward to hopefully seeing you then.
Um, and we hope you've enjoyed this session. So I'll stop the share now. And um, and any more items um, from you, either Paul uh, or Vic? Thank you for the something or 